Thank you very much, Father John. And I can just say to all of you how, how very happy I am to be here at Our Lady of Good Counsel. Uh, down at dinner tonight, uh, someone asked me, do you do many missions? And I said, none. <laughs> uh, my life uh, doesn't make it possible for me to do that. But here I am offering you a parish mission. And the reason I'm doing that is because of Father John Ricardo as my student, uh, to confirm him in his ministry to you. I know what a dedicated and, and fruitful priest he is. And he's been asking me for years, and I've been saying for years, you know, I don't do that. <laughs> but, well, yes, I do for Father John. So I'm very happy to do this and to be with you. And we have given this mission the title, The Mass, Supreme Encounter with God in Jesus. And there are three talks in this mission, tonight's talk, one tomorrow morning and another in the afternoon. And as part of the mission also, I will be preaching the homily at all of the parish masses, uh, which will continue the theme, but it has, the homily has to work for people that aren't at the mission. So let's think of three talks in the mission, all of them carrying the basic title, Mass, Supreme Encounter with God in Jesus. And in tonight's talk, I want to, we're going to just start moving through the parts of the Mass. And you've been to Mass lots of times, so I'm counting on you remembering how it goes. Uh, I'm going to talk about what it means as it unfolds. And the word encounter will be uh, a key that opens it at every step along the way. But in the talk tonight, we'll talk about a first part of the Mass which we call the Liturgy of the Word, where we're listening to the Word of God. Uh, we could give the title then to this first talk, Gathering to Hear God Speak, Encountering Jesus in the Word. The second talk tomorrow morning will move on to what happens after we've listened to the Word and heard the homily, namely bringing the gifts to the hands of the priests and the transformation of those gifts during the course of the Eucharistic prayer. Enormous moment in the Mass. We could title this second talk, Encounter with God as Marvelous Exchange. We bring him our gifts. He transforms them and gives them back. And the third talk tomorrow afternoon will be the reception of communion and what that means. And we could entitle that communion as encounter with Jesus in the transformed gifts and being sent into the world as a new creation. So that's our mission. Three hours together to reflect carefully on this movement through the Mass. Encounter is one word. Another word that is very helpful for understanding the Mass is a dialogue, a conversation between God and his people. And this book that Father John so kindly gave to you uh, has a I like the title. Uh, the title is very simple, but it's deceptively simple. It's called, What Happens at Mass? God is acting at Mass to save us. And we are reacting to his action. And we do this in words, 
And we do this also, he does it with words. And we do it with words back. But we do it with more than words. We do it with our whole lives. We say something with our lives to him. And he says something to us with what we have brought him and so forth. So dialogue is another way to follow the structure of the Mass. The Mass has a structure to it. You know, it's, it, and st structure, that, that doesn't, that's, that's more, not less. You, know, you sort of think, of, if you're following a ritual, if you're following a structure, maybe that's not really you or something. No, it makes us something bigger than we would be on our own. If I just were to say to you, hey, everybody, think of a good way to, to have a, make contact with God. Good luck. No, we have this structure given us by God himself. This is his gift to us so that we can enter into dialogue, into conversation, into an encounter. So, in the first part of the mast, we call it the liturgy of the word. Let's think about that expression. You kind of know that expression. But what words? Well, someone's talking. Something's to be grasped. Something's to be understood if there's word. Who's talking? God is. Duck. I mean, don't take that for granted. God is speaking. Hold on, everybody. Wake up. Receive it. The liturgy wants that to happen. But before we get to the reading of the word, let's watch how we get there. Uh, I like in, in my book, uh, there's a meditation on this about everybody's assembling. People are coming from all over. That's already mass. That's already grace at work. What brings you? What brings anybody? And we're all coming together from many places. It's a struggle to get here lots of times, but you're coming. Everyone's coming. That's beautiful. What brought you? Your faith. Where did you get your faith? From somebody. That's the only way faith moves all the way from the community of the first disciples of Jesus to us. It has passed from believer to believer, and it's ours. And it's also ours to pass on. But so just assembling is already so beautiful. And what's really bringing us together is not just you deciding. God's grace and goodness in your life has brought you, and you have responded to that. He doesn't force you here, so you come. But he helps you to come by the people who gave you your faith. So we gather, and then when we're ready to start, we, we all sing together a song. And this singing together is already the church becoming church, the assembly becoming what it will more and more become in the course of this hour together. It will become more and more one body. What happens at Mass is a whole bunch of people are made one body. Everybody's different. Everybody's beautifully different. And that beautiful difference in Christ forms a unity and a whole and, and singing together makes one beautiful sound and unity is beautiful and unity expresses itself and happens in song. And what are we singing about? We're singing about that we're here together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we're doing something once that cross is traced across us. And the priest greets us, not saying, hello there, everyone. He says very solemnly, very beautifully, 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and communion in the Holy Spirit be with you all. Well, who talks like that? And why do you talk like that? Because something unbelievable is happening. And the priest reminds the whole assembly that. And you respond, and with your spirit, and you're saying to the priest, be the priest for us now, and with your spirit. And so we can go somewhere. We're ready. We have the confession of our sins. So to prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries, that's not, a, that's not a negative start to things, start off with your sins. This is a reasonable place to begin if you come into the presence of the all-holy God. This is just reasonable. Something amazing. God is going to speak. Am I ready? Oh, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And he will. Right now, by speaking to us his holy word. And we're excited, and it's a feast day. It's Sunday, so we sing the Gloria. Oh, it's Lent, so we don't. Okay, but we will again. And, and so, you know, these, this just fun, these differences. So we save up for the Gloria. Oh, Lent, you don't hear it, you don't hear it, you don't hear it. Then you hear it. That's good. But anyway, all that is to, is to kind of collect the communities to, to, to take us from our scattered places, to get us singing, to get us ready, to come into the all-holy presence of God who is about to speak. And then the priest says a prayer that really focuses it. Let us pray. And then the prayer goes boom, boom, boom. Usually it's structured, oh God, who did this? Oh, God did that? We know. God did. Oh God, who did this? Do something like that now. Amen. And, okay, so that's, that's the way the prayer goes, huh? And what's all this doing? It's prepping us to hear the word of God. And then we all sit down. And we don't all sit down because, oh, you must be tired. Give them a break. Let everyone sit down. No. Actually, sitting down from standing is a liturgical posture. Everything we do with our bodies is a liturgical posture. Standing is a liturgical posture. Being seated isn't just getting off your feet. It's sitting to receive the Word of God. And then the Word of God is read to us. On Sundays, we have first a reading from the Old Testament. And that Old Testament reading, I, I know that in your parish you've been working in a series of homilies through the course of a year on this whole arc of salvation history. And this is when we read a, a passage from the Old Testament, we're recalling some moment, some dimension of the story of Israel's past. But we're not mainly when we're listening to the Old Testament text being read. It's not mainly we're just being given interesting information about religion in Palestine 3,000 years ago. That's not why we read the Old Testament. What we are doing is we are dipping into a part of the history of the world and especially the history of Israel in which God was actively at work moving history and the world toward its climax in the coming of Jesus Christ. And so the Old Testament text is ultimately, for us Christians, is ultimately part of the story about Jesus. And without the categories of the Old Testament thought and without seeing how God moved the whole world toward the coming of Jesus through millennia of preparation, without that context, we haven't got the whole sense of Jesus yet. But, okay, so you want your priest to be teaching you that. You want to learn about it yourself. That all helps. 
But ultimately, when the actual word of God is read during the course of the liturgy, what happens is that event from the past that the scriptures are speaking about somehow, because it's, because it's ultimately about Jesus, somehow that event from the past becomes also an event in this community that's hearing it. It becomes an event in this sense. The meaning of what God did in the past is, is what God is doing here and now in our lives. Your priest will preach that, teach you that, but more than your priest doing that, Christ himself is present in our minds, as, this, as the gospel says of his presence, opening our minds to the understanding of the scriptures. Do you remember the story of the appearance of the risen Lord to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus? They're walking uh, t toward Emmaus on its Easter Sunday. They don't know it's Easter Sunday. It's three days after Jesus has died. They are so disappointed that he's been crucified. They are downcast. They don't understand it. Jesus is actually risen, comes, uh, appears to them. They don't recognize him. He asks them what you're talking about. Do you, do you remember this story? Okay. So, so he, I, I, but think about it. It's, 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 you're supposed to be smiling during the story because, you know, he's the risen Lord. They don't know it. They say, man, are we ever down? I mean, we thought Jesus was the Messiah. And, uh, and now he's been crucified. And he says to them, this is the risen Lord. He says to them, how slow you are to understand the scriptures. And then the evangelist tells us, beginning with Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, Jesus showed them every passage of scripture which referred to him, showing that the Messiah had to suffer so to enter into glory. Now let's take that and understand what happens at Mass. Let's take that and understand what happens during the reading of the scriptures at Mass. I said, Jesus will open your minds to the understanding of the scriptures because we are gathered in his presence. He is risen Lord. He's here, always. At Mass, he is acting, and he acts in your mind and in your heart. And he opens your mind to the understanding of the scriptures. How? Let me quote the evangelist again. By taking Moses and the prophets and the Psalms and showing every passage of scripture which refers to him. And not only that, there's a way in which all of those passages can be summarized by the risen Lord himself. He summarizes it by saying, the Messiah had to suffer so to enter into glory. This is to say where the center of all God's work in the world is in the Messiah's suffering on the cross and so entering into glory. That happened then, there. And at Mass, the same happens here and now, in this assembly of us present. That's what happens at Mass. Because the Jesus who was then is risen, which means the Jesus who was is a Jesus who is. Now, I want to encounter him. I want to meet him. And I meet him in this first part of the Mass, in his word. A good way to understand this, what I'm saying about the relationship of the Old Testament reading to, uh, to the rest of the liturgy of the word is to think about the, the Easter Vigil 
You know, at the Easter Vigil, those of you that uh, have the experience of that, we have seven long readings from the Old Testament on that night. It takes a long time. You're, you're meant to pass the night in prayer on this holy night. But those seven long readings uh, take us through every phase of the Old Testament. And we're listening to them, again, because they're all ultimately about Jesus, the Messiah having to suffer, so to enter into glory. And on every, any Sunday, you know, Sunday is, East, is we, weekly Easter. That's why, we, that's why we pray on Sundays. That's why we gather for the Eucharist, especially on Sundays. You know, I, I, lots of people are able to do it on weekdays, too. But Sunday Eucharist for Catholics is normative, meaning you can't live without it. You can't live without it because you need this regular access. But, but, but it's our day of celebrating the Lord's resurrection. But the, the way we do that is by going back to Moses and the prophets and the Psalms and celebrating those texts in this assembly as what God is still doing in this assembly here and now. I call that in my book the event character of the proclamation of the word. The very reading of the word becomes an event for the community that hears it. And, and we say that. We're li I said we're sitting down, not because we're tired, but because we're listening. We receive the word. And then uh, when, the, when, the, when the passage that is to be proclaimed is finished, uh, the lector will say, the word of the Lord. Don't take that for granted. That's amazing. It's saying, God has just spoken. And we respond, thanks be to God. Boy, start meaning it more. Start meaning more. Thanks be to God. Don't take it for granted that God has spoken. Then I said, everything in the Mass is structuring a dialogue. Everything in the Mass is structuring an encounter. Everything in the Mass is structuring a covenant. There's two sides to dialogue, two sides to encounter two sides to covenant. There's God's energy and initiative, and then there's our response. And so we prepare a response. The Holy Spirit actually prepares this response in us in the responsorial song. It's called responsorial for two reasons. One is because there's a response that we repeat, a uh, psalm verse that is repeated again and again. But it's also responsorial in the sense that with the, with the inspired word, we're responding to the word. The assembly, you know, when the, when the reader reads, just one person is speaking. And that one of the baptized is the reader. And that person is a mouthpiece for God's holy word. But after that, what's the response and whom does it come from? It comes from the whole assembly singing a response. So this is, this is a, like a great big conversation between God and this assembly. And it, there's this, and then there's that, and then there's this. Second reading, God's going to speak again. The second reading is of a different nature. It's usually from one of the letters of the apostles. And it's a good way to think and watch for this in the second reading. All, mostly, most often from the letter to Paul, but other, other apostolic writers as well. Basically what the apostolic letters are doing is taking Old Testament texts and showing how they are fulfilled in Jesus. So the theological moves of what I'm talking about, how we understand the Old Testament, those are in fact uh, achieved uh, with, a, with a theological text uh, of, the, of the second reading from a letter of one of the apostles. After that, uh, the assembly moves. The assembly stands up. The assembly sings Alleluia. And you know that that's connected with the gospel. 
And you know that Alleluia. Oh, we don't do it in Lent. Okay, messing around with things. That's the way you know it's Lent. You don't sing Alleluia in Lent. But mo all the other time you sing Alleluia, and don't sing it in Lent because then, whoa, when you sing it on Easter, you remember, oh, that's Alleluia. That's Easter song. But Allelu Easter is all year long. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. And we're standing. Why? Because, and the gospel book is coming off the altar and being carried by the deacon or the priest and proclaimed with us standing. What does this mean? Why do we do that? Why can't we stay seated? Well, we're doing something with our bodies. We're enacting our belief. We're enacting our encounter. We're, we are enacting our understanding that the center of the scriptures is Jesus. The center of the scriptures is the gospel. And the center of the gospel is where all the gospels lead as their clear center, the death of Jesus and his resurrection from the dead. But if I said what I said already of the Old Testament, that we don't just read it because we're interested in uh, Palestinian religion three millennia ago, that's not why we read it. We read it because it's about Jesus and it all leads to now. Well, when we read the gospel, what's happening? Jesus himself is present in his action and in his word here and now in this assembly. And look, you know that Jesus has risen from the dead. Well, let's understand that a little more deeply. What, just what's that mean? It, you know, we kind of think, well, I'm not quite sure what it means, but it must be that he's uh, up and running again. Uh, no. Uh, He's entered a whole new realm. He, he has entered the, a, a divine realm where, where divine glory bursts out of his body. But the one who lived this human life, the one who lived this human life and whose life ended in this horrible crucifixion, which was his act of pouring out his love for us and taking our sins to himself and destroying them somehow, as the innocent one suffering this for love. That one is risen from the dead. And when you're, think about this, when you're risen from the dead, something very amazing has happened. <laughs> and I, and as I say, you don't understand it if you think he's just up and running again, like before. Uh -uh, it's not like before. But, He's, he's in a transcendent realm and able to be present when and where and how he will. And the one who has risen again is not just, oh, here he is. He's back. What's next? No, the one who has risen again is the one who lived his life saying and doing everything that is reported of him in the Gospels and, and ever so much more. And so when he rises, what rises with him is what he was and what he now is. So if we're hearing in this assembly a story from the Gospel, that's a story about the risen Lord who is present to you. He's standing here doing for you what he did then. Saying to you what he did then. That's his presence to you as risen Lord through the word. That's what we mean when we say Christ is present in his word. And our, our song our incense, if we use that, our reverence, our standing, all that is because we recognize his presence. Every one of the four Gospels very clearly is, or each of the evangelists does it in a different way, but every one of the four Gospels very clearly is, has its center in the account of the Lord's death and his resurrection. 
And all the other stories that are told, depending on how each of the evangelists does it, all the other stories are told in such a way that we can understand that the whole life of Jesus was leading toward his conscious choosing to let himself be handed over in death for our sake. That's what the stories are all told for. And it takes a certain amount of learning how to read the gospel to see that that's what they're all for. They're not simply biographies about Jesus who, who had an unfortunate finish. No, they're stories told in such a way as to see that Jesus' whole existence was leading toward this mysterious and, and almost impossible to comprehend act of his death and then the unexpected rectification of, of all the sin of the world by that death and God the Father's raising him up. So the Gospels are about that. That's what the Gospels mean. So if we are reading any one part of the Gospel on any given Sunday, it's to remind us that in this way we are Lord led toward the center, which is the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the death and what, what the death and resurrection of Jesus means for us is ultimately that that risen Lord is ascended into heaven. What does that mean? We tend to think it means, oh darn, he's gone elsewhere. No, that's not what ascension into heaven means. What ascension into heaven means is that Jesus has been permanently established in a divine realm. That, that Jesus is permanently where God is as the crucified and risen Lord. And that he is totally victorious in his death. And that his death is established as life and as, as at the center of who God is and what God's relationship with the world is. We say this in different ways. The scripture says it in different ways. He is constantly interceding for us. What does that mean? Constantly interceding for us. He is constantly the one who was crucified before his father saying, save them. I poured out my life for them. Keep pouring it out. And that's what he's always doing. He's constantly pouring himself out for us be, as, he, as he started to do or as he climaxed in doing on the cross. And he's constantly pouring out his life for us, which is him risen. Because if you're only dead, will you stop pouring out your life? He's not only dead. In his death and in his pouring out of his life, he was vindicated by his father. And so his death which pours out, remains a permanent pouring out of his body and blood for us. And that happens at Mass. That's how you give it. You come under its force. It's proclaimed. And the proclamation of it is it. The proclamation is the encounter. It's impossible to faithfully proclaim this without what is being proclaimed overtaking us all. It overtakes us quietly, but invasively, even as I'm speaking to you now. But in the Mass, infallibly, it invades us. And another way of saying what ascension is. It's the crucified raised up and permanently established in the divine realm and so able to do what God does, which is to be everywhere and touch everyone alive. That's what our ascended Lord does. Another way of saying that is by sending the Holy Spirit. 
And so after ascension comes Pentecost, which is an enormous outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And what's that? That's the Spirit by which we know Jesus. That's the Spirit that comes from the Father and the Son so that we can know what the human mind is too small to know, but what is made big enough by the Holy Spirit to know. So we know God in Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Not by getting all the smart people together and coming up with an explanation. No, by the action of God's Spirit, which helps us to realize it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the scriptures. They are inspired. That means inspirited. The scriptures are the Holy Spirit's tool for us to understand the whole history of the world as culminating in the death and resurrection of Jesus and for us to understand that that moment is now when the church gathers so that we become disciples of Jesus through the encounter with Jesus. And we become, using language that you're developing in this archdiocese for unleashing the gospel, we become contagious disciples who cannot be come contagious when you meet God in Jesus doing this for us, pouring out his life in Jesus and alive in us and making this assembly of many different people one body, one spirit in him. So, how is the resurrection known? Where is it? He's risen. Show me that. I can only show you an assembly celebrating Eucharist. I show you Jesus, risen and active, forming his one body, the church, so that his risen body becomes coextensive with his body, the church. Now, all that I was able to say, just talking about the scriptures, well, what's, what else is going to happen? You know, the rest of the Mass. And there's a whole lot more. After the gospel has been proclaimed, the priest preaches. And what the priest is, is, is trying to do in his preaching is to extend this understanding or to, to help with the understanding of what has this word mean, what does this word mean for us here and now? And so, you know, you, can, you could go on and on and on about any of these scriptures. And of course, you can't do that. You only got so much time in a given. So you do a little. But you get into a pattern. You get into a rhythm of constantly coming back to this event character, the proclamation of the word, this climax in the gospel. Well, and, and, but then the priest is also going to lead you by his preaching into the rest of the Mass. Because, you know, you know, in one sense you could say, okay, well, that was all fun, let's all go home. No, we got to get to the main stuff. Here's a way to understand what happens next. After, after the homily, we stand and profess the creed. And St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the 4th century when he was preparing catechumens for baptism and teaching the creed to them, came up with a lucky line that I like to still use, what, what the creed is. He says the creed is the whole scriptures summarized in a single page. Beautiful way of understanding what the creed is. You know, if, you, if you read the whole Bible with a proper understanding, what you could say is, I believe 
in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, ascended, and coming again. I believe in the Holy Spirit, and I believe in the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. I believe, because the Word brought me there. And so this is my response. I said, God's saying something, and I'm saying something. God's saying something, and we're saying something. God has done all this in Jesus. I believe. Eh? I believe, and I will respond. And I, man, I want to say thank you. I want to adore God. I want to be worthy of this. I am not worthy. Make me worthy. God, wouldn't that be nice? And Jesus saying, yes, I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm making you worthy. Amazing. He's transforming us utterly. Come before God. Come into the presence of God. You come confessing your sins. Stand here now approaching the throne of grace with confidence. Tremendous transformation taking place because of the way God's coming at us. And so I want to adore him. I want to thank him. I want to live better. I need to be empowered to live better. I, want, I need so much. So we start listing what we need. The prayers. For this, let us pray to the Lord. For that, let us pray to the Lord. And for this, let us pray to the Lord. And it goes really wide. We're thinking of the whole world. We want the whole world here in this space of I believe. We want the whole world believing this. We want the church united and holy. We're praying for all of that. We ask for it. And then we move into the next part of the Mass. Uh, the next part of the Mass uh, is the bringing of the gifts forward to the hands of the priests. And we should think of that, first of all, as a very big response on our part to having heard God's word. And our response is going to be, and I'm, this is I'm just about to finish for tonight, but our, our response, I want to make a link for where tomorrow morning's talk is going to go. Our response to having deeply received the word of God is, is to bring forward gifts of bread and wine which are meant to represent our lives and to place our lives in a sense poor as they are or, or not poor, let's just say small as they are before the enormity and majesty of God who has so kindly come to us in this form that was so amazing but not ever overpowering. It, so we, we come with our, with our small gifts before the enormity of God and we, we place these gifts in the hands of the priest who it's like symbolically placing these gifts in the hands of Christ, placing our lives in the hand of Christ and saying, do something with this. Do something with our lives. Transform them. Make our lives say what you said by your dying and rising. Make our lives say that. And that's going to happen. Our lives are going to be transformed. So, that's big. That's huge. That's more than just words. So we talked about tonight, and I'm going to finish with this thought for you to summarize and to build a bridge to tomorrow. We talked tonight about the liturgy of the word, that God speaks, that there are words moving, that words are addressed to the understanding Understanding must grasp them. Something is affected, and words are an encounter between the one speaking and the one spoken to and the one speaking back. So words predominate in the first part of the liturgy. But think a little harder about the words. The words aren't mainly words in the sense of mainly sounds coming out of a human throat. 
you know, when you think about a word, it's kind of an amazing thing. I'm just up here making noises with my throat, taking in air, and all the noises I make reach your brains. <laughs> That's interesting. I, <laughs> you know, other animals are not that articulate. They make noises too, but, you know, we, we can do quite a lot with words. That's, that's lovely. Because I'm just making noise, and somehow I'm getting into your minds and hearts. But God does that too. But the, the liturgy of the word is not mainly words in that sense. The liturgy of the word, because it's God who's speaking, is ultimately God's action. What the words are about are what God has done. And what God has done, what God's activity in the world is. So that's what the liturgy of the word is. God's words are deeds. And he is enacting his deeds in this assembly. This is enormous. This is huge. And now, in the second part of the Mass, what becomes clear by means of words will become even clearer and even more intense a presence, not simply with words, but with food and drink eaten and drunk. That's your whole body. And you don't have to say anything after a while. It's just you in your body being transformed into a new creation. And you don't have to say anything. You are this new creation. So that's where we're going to go tomorrow on the basis of what we've done tonight. So don't forget this part. See you all tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you.